Hey everybody, uh, welcome to the Pandemic Baseball Book Club. Uh, I am Dan Epstein, author of, among other things, uh, The Captain and Me on and off the field with Thurman and Munson with uh, Ron Bloomberg, which will come out in paperback on May 3rd. And we are here with Craig Calcaterra, author of Rethinking Fandom, How to Beat the Sports Industrial Complex at Its Own Game, which comes out via Belt uh, belt publishing on April 5th. Is that correct? That is correct. Although they're sending it out to everybody already. <laughs> There's, there are no rules. It's a small press. And so I think like half of the people I know on the planet who have ordered it already have it. So. Gotcha. So, well, anyway, I, I just finished it and, and I absolutely loved it. Uh, obviously, I mean, um, there's, there's a lot in there that you've, uh, talked about in, oh, and I should mention this, um, I think uh, probably most of you listening know Craig from Hardball Talk, his uh, his previous uh, blog with uh, NBC Sports, and uh, now he has the newsletter Cup of Coffee, which is awesome, and you should subscribe to it. So That's awful nice of you to say, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta give you props, man. Uh, so so obviously, there's a lot of stuff in here. Uh, in rethinking fandom that you've touched upon uh, uh, with some regularity in cup of coffee. Um, but I guess, you know, my first question is what motivated you to write this book? What, you know, why, why draw all these threads together in one, uh, one package? I, I think what every person who's like blogged a lot, realizes this, that over time they have like eight hobby horses that they just like just constantly constantly ride <laughs> and, and eventually you're like wait a minute I keep coming back to these same issues they must be important to me and um, I think what happened with me is that over the years my fandom changed because I went from being a, just a baseball fan to being a baseball fan who wrote about the game and I, I didn't have to write about the game in some faux objective AP style, whatever. I could right. still you're be a fan. A, you're not a beat writer. Exactly. So I didn't have to compartmentalize things. I was able to like sort of have my fandom change and talk about it some as I was still writing about baseball. And and it did change over the course of, you know, 11, 12 years writing for NBC. And I just realized that there were a lot of things about being a sports fan that were dumb. A lot of things that annoyed me. A lot of things that made me ask, wait, why am I having to rationalize this? Or why am I rooting for that? And it just struck me in, in one particular day uh, about a year and a half ago that I should put this all down in a manifesto because I'm going to forget it all otherwise. So that was kind of the real reason. There was no like external event that said, aha, I have a book. It was mostly this is stuff I've been bitching about to my friends for a long, long time. And uh, I might as well bitch about it in a book. Well, so the title "Rethinking Fandom." Why, why should we rethink fandom? Why, uh, and why especially you know now of all junctures in sports history? I, I think rethinking was a word that my publisher and I thought about for a long time because the 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 real issue that when I when I talked about you know this is what I'm thinking about. Her response to me, and, and Belt Publishing has not put out sports books. These are not sporty people. If you're familiar with Belt Publishing, they put out like left wing Midwestern and Appalachian like, you know, stuff Perfect. about important issues, not about yeah. sports fans. I mean, they put about, you know, poisoning water and poverty and opioid crises and things like that. They talk about important crap. And so my publisher, who is a sports fan, but she rhetorically asked me, why should I even be a sports fan if you're identifying all these problems? Why not just give up sports? It's not important. And uh, that made me think a lot because there's got to be a sweet spot between the, I've just had so much of this, these billionaires and I've had so much of these athletes and I've had so much of the business of sports that drives me crazy. I'm going to go get into needlepoint. I mean, that's a completely valid thing. And so I didn't want to write the book that said, don't be a sports fan anymore because it's negative, mostly because I don't believe it. I like sports still. But I, I sort of want to suggest to people that we can think differently about it. There are different ways to be a sports fan. You are no less valid a fan if you reject the sort of 
cliched tropes of fandom. If your loyalty wanes, if your loyalty strays, if you decide that you no longer want to root for the team that you rooted for for 25 years and your dad rooted for for 50 years, that's okay. Um, but it does require a little getting your mind around it. And so that's kind of where I was going with that. Yeah, which I love because, I mean, I always... I always, you know, I grew up in a lot of different places. Um, mm -hmm. Same here, same. And here. so it was like, you know, like who who I rooted for depended a lot on, you know, I mean, you know, like you, I I spent summers rooting for the Braves uh, when they were terrible back in the 1970s because I was spending summers with my grandparents in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and they, you know, they had uh, um, uh, Biff Pocaroba. Biff Pokoroba, yes, absolutely. I loved <laughs> Biff Pokoroba, and and they were terrible. But you know, big, thanks to Ted Turner, I could watch baseball every night, and so I developed an affection for them. But you know, yeah, through, throughout my life, really, I've always juggled, you know, at least a couple of different teams. I mean, I'm still a Tigers fan from, you know, from when I got into baseball, but. I mean, there were times where I was rooting for the Tigers and the Milwaukee Brewers, and they were in the same division. Right. So, you know, I, because the Brewers were awesome, you know, they had Gorman Thomas and Sixto Liscano and, you know, people like that. So, uh, so I, I really like that in your book, you're, you're just like, you know, you don't, this notion that like, you know, who you root for is, you know, is completely bound to where you grew up, bound to who your parents root, rooted for, and that, you're not a true fan unless you've stuck with the same team through thick and, you know, soul crushing thin for uh, your entire life. Yeah. It, so we had a very similar thing. Right. I, and I think we probably have talked about this online before or something, because, you know, I was born in Michigan and I lived right. in Michigan until I was about 11 and I was a Tigers fan and we moved to West Virginia and it was the same, you know, TBS kind of thing to watch the Braves. And for years, I would tell this story, you know, at at parties or I wrote about it on my blog or whatever about the the soul heavy burden of changing your sports fandom and what does it mean and I think I even used like these grand stupid analogies about straying on your loved one or something <laughs> and I used to think that way because we're all conditioned to think that way something's wrong with us if we are abandoning the team that for whatever reason accident of birth or accident of geography became our rooting interest my parents weren't baseball fans. I, I was a Tigers fan because they were on my radio and on my TV and I was in Michigan. And you had uh, Ernie Harwell to listen to. Who was, that helped. That definitely yeah. helped. I went from Ernie Harwell to, you know, it's a fairly big fall off to Skip Carey, but Skip was still pretty <laughs> solid Yeah. Um, in the same way. Plus he ripped off Ernie Harwell's bit about the, you know, a lady from, uh, you know, Owasso caught that foul ball in her right. purse kind of thing. Yeah, but that was always cute. Uh, but the thing is, I changed my fandom when I was 12 years old because I just did. And it didn't matter. I still love baseball. That was the whole point. I liked watching the baseball games. And then in the last few years, because I'm a writer and I had to watch other things, because the Braves changed so much about the way the organization ran and how the ownership worked and their ballpark and just so much changed, uh, I started to stray away from the Braves too. But that wasn't anywhere near as difficult. And I realized, well, that's not hard at all. Why is this hard for anybody? And, and I get it. If you're from Boston and you grew up in Boston and, you know, your dad, you know, Sully, you know, from Boston, <laughs> you know, a friend of Eddie Coyle or something right. is, is uh, a Red Sox fan. I get that. It's hard to get your brain around that. And I'm not saying that everyone should, I'm not saying we should all make ourselves free agents every year and decide which team sort of, you know, fits our moral bill and ethical bill. And we're going to now root for this team this year. No, that's ridiculous. I'm just saying that if you get to the point where your life changes or you get fed up, or you ask yourself, why am I even watching these guys? Or most importantly, that's the question I think that goes through everything in this book is, if you get to a point where the thing you think you're supposed to be rooting for or you have been rooting for is more misery than fun, you really need to assess what you're in this for because sports are supposed to be fun and entertaining. Right. And, and no one gives you a badge for, you know, the example I use here, watching the Minnesota Timberwolves lose for 30 straight years you're not going to win an award for that you might as well enjoy your leisure time right right that the, the whole quality quality of life issue if, if uh, your fandom is impacting that negatively then then yeah you should should move on but the the, the other thing you know that that another point that you hit though is that um 
that sort of devotion, that like lifelong devotion to a specific franchise that we're talking about. I mean, you, you talk in the book about how that kind of makes it, like if you subscribe to that, that makes it easier for the team to kind of exploit your fandom. Yeah, there's, you know, if if the if the fan demand is inelastic, I'm probably just going to piss off real e economists by saying it this way because I'm getting it wrong. But, you know, if they know that you're a mark, if they've got you, no matter what they do to you, what possible incentive do they, and when I say they, I mean, it could be the team, it could be the league, it could be uh, the media that surrounds the team, it could be your fellow fans. If, if you are an absolute mark and you are a glutton and you are going to endure anything, you're a Cincinnati Reds fan right now. And I'm in Ohio, so I know a bunch of these people. God, help them. <laughs> um, you know, your owner basically ships out everybody good except Joey Votto because he can't be shipped out. Uh, you cut the payroll down below where it was in like 1992. Uh, you show no interest whatsoever in putting a winning team on the field. You're about to embark on rebuild number six or something in the last you know 15 years. At what point, uh, if you just keep coming back and you keep buying tickets or you keep watching on TV or something, do they have any incentive to change their behavior? Now, I'm not saying that you know this is not some populist fan revolt. We can make them do bend to our will. Uh, but because you're a mark, they're going to continue to do things like that. They take advantage of our loyalty and our emotion and our devotion to colors and logos and history. And that's really what it's all about. There are Reds fans all over the place right now, for example, that are fans of the big red machine. Right. Or fans of, you know, Eric Davis or something. Um, and they're they're leveraging that to to keep you in the fold and keep getting money from you. Um, so our, our irrational fandom, though completely understandable, and I, again, I try to walk this line, it's hard to walk the line sometimes, it's understandable, I don't begrudge it, that's part of the joy sometimes of being a fan is having that irrational love for something that is so ridiculously silly and out of our control, uh, but that does make it easier for the sports industrial complex, as I so flurly put it, uh, to take advantage of us. So, I mean, you know, I know from our conversations on Twitter and it's it's and reading your stuff that you're not really one for nostalgia like no. like that's you know so like being into a team because of you know being into the Reds because of the big red machine that's not something that really you know resonates with you particularly it, it's hard it does a little like I mean I'm not I'm not immune to it I'm not going to say that I'm some you know icy eyed person who I, I I have spilled more ink about Alan Trammell than I ever <laughs> anyone ever needs to um and Tiger Stadium and right. things like that and the 1980s Braves and the aesthetics such as it was um I'm aware of its appeal and history to some degree matters, but that's it's that's just an element. That's not an end of it. If if the reason you like something is because your dad liked it, or the reason you like something was because when you were a kid you have good associations with it, I don't know that that's strong enough to to do anything for us. I mean, think about the food you like, the movies you liked, the the political party you belong to. Um, a lot of that stuff is just because that's how we've always done it, and we have weird associations with it that that bring all the things that nostalgia bring with it that's a dangerous place to be yeah but but where i'm going with this is that you know with nostalgia there's sort of an element of like it was better than than mm, it is mm -hmm. today but i i think like when you and i were kids you know i was kid in the 70s you were a kid in the 80s that there was like from a fan experience baseball was better like, i think term, i think in, there's truth to that yeah, I um, and, and I'll in, in a certain way, no, because like in a, I remember going to Tiger Stadium and, you know, I remember inhaling cigar smoke and I remember my mom worried that the flying bottle was going to hit me and stuff. I mean, that, those are still things I we, we all we both know. We both know people that grew up in New York in the 70s and the 80s that think that that was just like amazing and everything else has sucked. But you know what? I'm sorry. Getting killed or mugged or something is not something I look back on fondly. Um, so there were elements of it that were certainly nowhere near as good. There's a, a much fan friendlier element in certain ways. But the one thing that I think is most important about sports, and I talk about it in the book in terms of a social contract, um, we give them our love, our loyalty and our money, they at least try to win. Um, that was definitely a more one to one sort of thing. Now, there were 
terrible teams back then. Don't get me wrong. But if you owned a, a baseball team at some point, I'd say this lasted probably until the 80s, maybe even into the early 90s. Uh, if you did not at least attempt to put something entertaining on the field, maybe not good. I mean, Bill Veck put out a lot of bad teams that were entertaining. Um, people would come. People would buy tickets. They don't care now. They really don't care. The fan experience is there as the most efficient mode of separating us from our money. It's always been that to some degree, but it's now that's clearly at the end. And the idea that they're going to put on something good for us now is, is just a very different kind of a thing. It's so corporate. It's so commercialized. Um, it's cynical too. Um, they, they, the caring about the game doesn't seem to matter as much. And I know I'm sounding like an old fart when I say this kind of <laughs> stuff, but I mean, we've all been to ball games, you know how it is. And, yeah. uh, are, are the attention is on everything except the product on the field. Yeah, absolutely. And there, and you know, and it's like, once they get you in there, there's so many other ways to take your money. Whereas, you know, when we were going to Tiger stadium as kids, you know, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that expensive to, to buy hot dogs and Cokes for a family of four. Whereas now it's, you know, that that's a lot of money. Yeah. And even if money is no object for you, just the aesthetic experience of going to a ball game and you could still get this in low minors and things, but like the idea of, I want to go to a ballpark, maybe you do it by yourself. I'm one of those wackos who will go to a ballpark by himself, yeah, um, sit down, watch a game, not be bothered by a bunch of crap. Um, that's just, it's just non-existent now. Yeah. And um, the, you know, the, and then there's also the element, you know, like, back in the 70s and 80s and you know maybe up to the 90s you know the fan experience was a little more egalitarian you know it's like yes <laughs> you know it's like like we could walk up to uh, the first ball game i ever went to 1976 at tiger stadium we like walked up day of the game on a sunday my dad bought us four tickets behind home plate for like what 24 dollars for all six, which even if you, you know, adjust it for inflation, that's like way lower than it is. Yeah. Now. It's like a hundred dollars, you know, it's, uh, you can't it's get like, one ticket for that. Now. Yeah. It's the, the ballpark experience. And I'll, I'll go outside of baseball for this example. Cause I just saw this, you know, in the news today, uh, the Buffalo bills are getting a new yes. football stadium. Uh, it's going to be a massively publicly funded stadium. Uh, the Buffalo Bills old state, I don't know what it's called now. Rich stadium is what I think of it as, but whatever it's called now, um, holds something like 72 or 75,000 people or something like that. Uh, their average attendance for the last several years has been between 65 and 69,000, not full houses, but they draw, you know, 65, 69,000 people pretty regularly to Buffalo Bills games. The new stadium is going to have 60,000 seats. Um, it is a conscious decision to limit the number of seats a huge percentage of those seats are going to be ultra luxury seats, boxes, things like that. Uh, every ballpark, every stadium, every arena that has been built in the last 25 years, but especially in the last 10 to 15 have been aimed at making going to a public, going to a in-person sporting event, uh, a luxury good in ways that it never was. It was always something that, Hey, you needed a little bit extra money to go to a ball game. It was a luxury in the box broadest seats, sense, but you know, it's... right. Oh, I got box seats. Yeah. Dad saved up a couple right. of paychecks and we all took the family out. That was a thing that happened. That's not a thing that happens now. Um, it is an extraordinarily expensive undertaking. The ballparks and the stadiums are not built for the common fan. Um, and I don't even just mean me being a, an internet commie saying the workers and the proletariat aren't invited. I'm like talking like even a mid-level white collar dude who just has a regular job. Uh, if you're a project manager at, you know, an office furniture company, you're not going and buying tickets to games very often. You just right. can't. You're, you're not buying a seat license or, or whatever. Yeah, there's an example in the book I give about the Golden State Warriors and like, you know, the the ground central on the planet for income inequality is San Francisco Bay Area, obviously. So I don't feel bad for the people necessarily who are priced out of their Golden State Warriors tickets because of the new new arena they have. Uh, but even people who buy all of our standards pretty much are fairly wealthy people are getting priced out of that. Wow. <laughs> if you're making like $400,000 a year and you just can't 
do that seat license and the commitment and everything else that they're demanding. And the, I put the details of it in the book of what Golden State is demanding from season ticket holders now. It is redonkulous. It is not for you and me and the common man. Was this something like a 60 year commitment or? Like, oh, it's ridiculous. It's like, you got to buy like four tickets. You got to commit for like 15 years plus the seat license. They're no longer having parking involved. You could pay like, you know, $200,000 for a year's worth of tickets, but you, they're still not even doing the parking anymore. Wow. Uh, and you had to decide these were like, they're bringing in people who had season tickets for 25, 30, 40 years to Warriors games. And they made them decide there on the spot as soon as they were told the terms within the space of 10 minutes you're either committing to this or you're not and if you're not you're out you're no longer a season ticket holder it's like oh my god they there is corporate money to be made there is extraordinarily rich people money to be made uh it is not for us anymore do, do you think that's ever going to change or is it just that, that ship has sailed I think it's sailed. Um, the NFL was sort of the leader here because the NFL's business model really, and people were talking about this 25, 30 years ago, it's turned the 32 stadiums into basically TV studios, right? Because all the money comes from national TV contracts for the most part. They get a lot of money from people buying tickets, but uh, you know, you could have an empty house in the NFL and still make money because the TV deals are so big. Um, now, especially in baseball, you're seeing it in every other sport too, the economic prospects of a sports franchise are so far divorced from ticket sales now compared to the way they always have been. It's not even funny. You can run a major league baseball team and not draw anybody and still make a bunch of money. And if there's not that relationship between we need people to buy tickets and show up and buy beer and we, you know, and us being profitable, then it's never going back. And I don't see how it's going back because everything's based on TD money. Everything's based on increasingly real estate. Everything's based on gambling money. There are all these ancillary income streams for sports franchises now to where one of the least important are ticket sales. Yeah. No, and, and it's interesting because you know, I was th thinking about like, um, every time I post something about Kirk Flood on social media, whether it's, you know, on my Twitter account or my big hair and plastic grasp page, there inevitably, you know, you get two or three people coming out of the work to say, you know, like it's Kirk Flood's fault that tickets are so expensive and, you know, like free agency led to higher ticket prices. And, and it seems like, like, I'm not sure that that was ever even the case, but it's certainly not the case now. The thing I always say to somebody who says that it's the athlete salaries that are driving ticket prices is look at the Cleveland Indians slash guardians. Okay. Their, their payroll is lower now than it was in, you know, the 1990s. They have not lowered their ticket sales, <laughs> their ticket prices, the Oakland A's slash payroll tremendously in this fire sale they're having over the off season here. They jacked up ticket prices last year, right before it happened. There is no connection. The only connection between ticket prices uh and reality is is just who was willing to buy them yeah supply and demand so i mean why do you know to talk about this a little bit in the book why do, why do people and we saw this with with the uh you know the, the labor talks uh mlb labor talks recently why are there still so many fans who side with the owners over the players I think there are two reasons, one of which is really understandable. The other one is kind of regrettable, but changing. Um, the first reason is that players come and go. The team colors are always there. If you're a New York Yankees fan, you have rooted for the pinstripes your entire life. The Steinbrenner family owns the pinstripes. You know, uh, Aaron Judge doesn't own the pinstripes and he'll be gone in a few years and you are still a Yankees fan. Right. So we identify just sort of subconsciously with the team and we the owner and the owner's side we we don't i mean now we we know more because of social media and so much information we we know the names of every owner but you know in the 90s it's possible someone might have not even known who owned the boston red sox they just knew hey i'm a red sox fan and right. the red sox are against the players because the team so there's that allegiance that we have to the colors and the jersey and everything else uh, the, and that's not going to change. That'll always be a default because the team is my team. That's who I root for. Right. Uh, the other thing I think is certainly the way the media landscape has always worked until very, very recently, almost all of the media with the, ex 
exception of one kook at any given time, like Murray Chess was like the only guy who was talking to like the players union or uh, individual players about labor issues. Uh, but almost everybody else has their their access and their livelihood. And I don't mean this in an unethical way. I'm not saying that someone's like giving bad reporting because they have access. But the reality of the situation is if you're a beat writer for the Los Angeles Dodgers, you're covering the team. And if you piss off the, the owner, you're far more likely to have adverse career consequences than if you piss off Ron Say. Right. So for years and years, the, the default is always going to be towards ownership. And we have that more institutionally now too. A huge number of reporters and people who cover the game either work directly for Major League Baseball and the clubs for like MLB.com or whatever, or they work for a rights holder like ESPN or Fox or somebody. And uh, that's another thing that's going to be a filter. You're going to either subconsciously or in the case of a few unfortunate souls, quite consciously uh, give a an ownership and a league line when it comes to labor and business and not a player line that's changed a lot now social media is such that there are a lot of us wacko lefties out there who talk about labor and talk about everything else and have access to far more information than we used to we saw it with this last go around with the lockout i think that the sort of coverage and the discussion of of labor issues was a little bit more balanced uh, but you know, the institutions are, in, are what they are for a reason. They have sort of a gravity about them that cause people to view the world through their eyes. Right. Right. No, that, that makes sense. Now, I mean, along those lines, like I, I've, you know, I'm surely not the only person who said this is that as much as I loathed Bud Selig, uh, during his tenure as, uh, acting and then official baseball commissioner, uh, Rob Manfred kind of makes me miss those uh, halcyon <laughs> ceiling days. Um, how do you feel about that? And and you know and and really like you know how much of that is Manfred and how much of it is just you know the way of things. I. I will not whitewash Bud Selig. I have a column that you could find, like an NBC column that's on there. It's like Bud Selig, greatest commissioner in Major League Baseball history. And it's not like an ironic thing. I really do think he was by the objective measure of what the job was. Mm -hmm. And and it's also because all the commissioners were basically terrible. So he wins by right. default. <laughs> right. um, Bud Selig for... He did a lot of very bad things for baseball and he really helped move more than anybody else the game into where it is now, as far as just being this weird corporate entity that does not brook dissent among owners. There will never be another Bill Vec because he won't be allowed into the club. That's a Bud Selig thing, making sure that there's an orthodoxy among or ownership uh, that keeps it so they don't have to collude because they all think the same way. He did a right. lot of bad stuff in that regard. Rob Manfred has taken it to the next level. Uh, you know, as far as this sort of baldly commercializing baseball in ways we never would have thought of before. Two days ago, they just announced that the World Series is now officially the Capital One World Series. That's like the name. And you will see, no one else will do this. No, I mean, I'm not going to refer to it as the Capital One World Series. Right. Neither are you or any fans. But if you work for MLB.com or if you work for MLB Network or something like that, or you're going to hear whoever replaces Joe Buck on the World Series call saying, welcome to the World Series brought to you by Capital One. I mean, that's just gross. Yeah. Um, Rob Manfred has taken it to a new level. The difference between those two guys is Bud Selig actually does love baseball. For all yes. of his faults as a commissioner and an owner and all the bad crap he did, um, I don't doubt for a moment that he loves baseball and he's knowledgeable about baseball. And we are willing to forgive someone if they share that sort of love that we have, even if everything else about them is just abhorrent to us. And I, I think politically this way, yeah, like Ronald Reagan, if you just look, if you took his name off of all of the things he did and just said, these are all the accomplishments, initiatives and ideas that he had that maybe didn't come true. This is what he stood for. You, you would like be, you would, you know, if you're like me anyway, you'd say that's terrible. But a lot of people have these warm feelings about Ronald Reagan because damn it, he loved America and he was nice and smiled. Right. Um, and I think Seelig gets a little bit of that. Whereas Rob Manfred is just sort of a new Gingrichy figure where they pretty much stand for all the same crap, but he's just you, right? right. And, right. and people, <laughs> people work reasons. that way. And, and look, me, you, and what, 500 other people pay really close attention to like what Rob Manfred does in his job, I think. I don't think most baseball fans care. Uh, they only think about it when he makes the news. When he says, you know, the World Series trophy is a piece of metal, that makes the news because all the radio people and all the, you know, columnists are talking about it. But I don't think anyone knows when Rob Manfred changes this bylaw and the major league rules uh, that's going to create this big negative effect. People don't pay attention to that except, you know, wackos like us. Yeah, yeah. And the, the 
you know, something else in the in the book that uh, that you talk about that that you know I've, I've thought about this before, but I guess I hadn't thought about this in a while. Is just like how you, you talk about social activism and and social activism among uh, among players, and and that baseball is really by far the most conservative of all uh, professional sports when it comes to such things. Um, yet you also talk about how, you know, we can, you know, like, like it sort of behooves us to, you know, like the, the, the rare out outcroppings of social act acti activist activity among players in baseball or any other other sport, like, you know, like it, as fans, like we, should, you know, we really should get behind that. Maybe you can yeah, talk about I, that a bit. Yeah, I, so I think where I go from that is, because I spend a lot of time in the book talking about how, you know, our teams might disappoint us. <laughs> um, I might become very disillusioned if I'm a Cleveland Browns fan and they just signed a guy who has 22 sexual assault complaints against them. That might really bother me. And all the other injuries that the Cleveland Browns have done to me over the years might have, um, that, that might be the tipping point. And man, I don't know if I could even support this team anymore. I've seen people say that there. I see it, them say it all the time. And so the, the last part of the book, I'm talking about other ways for us to have something akin to a devotion that we would have to a team if we can't, for whatever reason, even if it's temporarily, root for the team that we wanted to root for. And one way is to root for players. You know, a, a guy goes to another team. Uh, I can root for that guy because I like to see his game. I love his game. I'm going to watch right. Kevin Durant play wherever he plays for because I just love his game. Damn it. That's probably a bad example. I'm not a big basketball fan. I think he's hated, <laughs> but I don't know. Anyway, um, but, you know, that's one way. And then another thing you can grab onto uh, is whether that player, if you just like the cut of his jib and whether that's socially, politically, or as an entertainment popular figure, celebrity, Um and if I'm looking at a sea of players or if I'm looking at a sea of teams and I don't know who to grab onto because it all just seems so bad to me. Well, you know, Mookie Betts is a bowler and and I like bowling and I'm going to root for a bowler. That That's completely legitimate. That is no more irrational than whatever reason caused you to root for the Kansas City Royals when you were a kid. I mean, I like bowling, too. So Mookie Betts is my guy. It's also possible if you if you are sort of wired the way I am that you might like the fact that, uh, you know, Schlobotnik from the Mudville Nine is down at a protest that you like. One, because it's weird because all players aren't going to do that very often. But if if you can identify with an athlete or any celebrity or any person in your life uh, for some reason, that's just as valid as a reason to root for them or to want to see them succeed. Right. And I'm not saying... I will root for any player who supports, you know, my view of, uh, you know, uh, forestry regulation, because that's really important to me. And as long as this shortstop is big on my forestry regulation uh, feelings, he's going to be my guy. No wrong. Yeah. Right. But that's not a non-reason. And that's something that you can glom onto. If everything else is gone and you still like sports and you still like the, the aesthetics of sports and the competition of sports, but you don't feel you can just watch a game without having some interest, why not root for a guy who you just like the way he's wired? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, uh, the, um, where was I going to go with that? So, so the, um, you know, oh, well, something in the book that uh, I was looking for, but I, uh, unless I missed it, I, I don't think I saw it, was there's no mention of uh, fantasy sports, fantasy yeah. baseball. Yeah, I, I think I nodded to it real briefly um, in the end. There's a, there's this thing there about meta fandom, and I, mm -hmm. that's a word I just kind of made up of, you know, being a fan about around sports. Like I'm a fan of memorabilia. You know, a lot of people collect baseball cards. Or, you know, I got into baseball because I collected baseball cards. It right. was no guarantee that I was going to become a baseball fan. I might've just been a sports card collector my whole life, but that's kind of being a meta fan. You're in the world of sports because of something on the side. Fantasy sports is something that a lot of people get interested in and maybe they don't even like the games, but they like the, the lure of fantasy sports. <laughs> Gamblers do that too, but uh, that could be a little bit more negative. Um, the one, I, the other thing about fantasy sports, I think the reason I didn't really hit on it so much is I don't play it a lot. I used to, um, I kind of stopped for just a bunch of personal reasons, mostly because of my poor organizational skills, but I think that's a completely valid mode to be into sports. Um, I do think that fantasy and sabermetrics tends, and, and I am a 
fellow traveler of sabermetricians. I have very good friends who have things named after them or who invented stats and work in front offices now because I'm an old guy who was a huge online baseball fan in the 90s. So I know all these people. They're, they're friends of mine, most of them. Um, but <laughs> uh, sabermetrics, fantasy sports has sort of commoditized players in a way that even if the original intent was to find inefficiencies and improve the game and everything, it's kind of alienated me a little bit. Um, when I was a kid, I wanted to be the center fielder for the Detroit Tigers. I didn't want to be the general manager. And that's right. kind of changed a lot. Um, fantasy sports can do that a little bit too. Uh, when I talked earlier about the negative things from sports, there's nothing more negative in the world than hearing somebody just bitch and complain about what a pitcher did last weekend. <laughs> because it messed up his fantasy team or well, a quarterback or whatever. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of why I never really got into it. I, I remember sticking my toe in about like, you know, 1999, 2000, and, you know, uh, attempting to join a friend's rotisserie league. And I don't think I even made it through the draft. But The ones uh, I liked, I liked uh, simulations and I liked the computer games. And like, I, I was a big fan of like the Lance Hafner games, which were, I had them on Commodore 64 and then on early, early PCs where, you know statistical simulations you can run right. the 1986 or oh, 1987 yeah, no. I mean, Oklahoma a, State team I'm a huge stratomatic baseball fan that's that's and have been since I was a kid I mean that's but but yeah. like that's very different to me because no know, connection to the real player I don't have to right. see what he did today to see how I did I could but I can make up a roster of you know a bunch of weird I, I, the last thing I did along those lines I think I was on some <laughs> quote unquote celebrity league they just found a bunch of baseball writers to put them on one of those diamond mine leagues That's right like, you know a yeah. computer simulation league Tried that and one i too. and i decided to make a bit out of it and i only picked players who were either alcoholics like confirmed alcoholics right. uh were really really out of shape uh were members of the 1919 black Sox or were otherwise just like infamous and it was just a team i called them like the palookas or something and i just wanted a team of horrible people in right. every respect and i came in second so i was pretty happy about that <laughs> <laughs> nice but yeah i mean that and and that was what you know because i thought like well um you know you talk about like this sort of like detaching yourself from the team and at the time you know i didn't i didn't want to root against my team in real life because they were you know facing a pitcher who was on my fantasy team like that to me was yeah Oh, that's a, yeah that's a that seems like a negative part of fandom it's it's if if you get joy from you know watching the chicago cubs win why would you do something that causes you pain when they win right, right i mean exactly. or or at least if you can't compartmentalize it right so, right right it's, and it's because it goes both it goes both ways i you know in a lot of the book is is sort of characterized as me saying here's a good way to release your allegiance to a fan a team you've rooted for your whole life well maybe you want to make it stronger and stop doing things that make you question it if you really get joy out of it right right so i mean in in your life has there ever been a time where like you've kind of drifted away from the game or like either intention, either because something happened to put you off or because you just got into other stuff. The only time, and I think it's a pretty cliche thing, certainly for guys our age is, you know, huge, huge fan from like the age of five until I was about 15 or 16. Right. And then, you know, girls and music and right. getting into college and things like that. I never drifted away to the point at any given time, even through high school and college, I was the guy that the people would say, oh, he's a big baseball fan. Right. But comparatively speaking, way lower from, you know, I'd say 1990 through about 95 or 96. It was, I was way more what people would refer to as a common fan. And then it just like went way into overdrive back again, uh, 95, 96, around the time I got out of college and started to actually have free time in my life and right. stuff like that. And you think about it, but there was no real reason for it other than, when you're a 17 year old boy, you're much rather likely to spend a Friday night with a girl if you can, than you are to spend them with the Atlanta Braves. Right, or in a concert or, yeah, no. Exactly, I, yeah. That, yeah, no, I mean, that, that was that was definitely it for me. It was like, like I, I really, I don't think I was even aware that the Tigers were in the in the playoffs in 87, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's just like, because you know, that would have been, yeah, uh, start of my junior year of college and you know, yeah, playing in bands, you know, being on the college radio station. It's like, that was all way more important to me. Well, it's funny. I say I drift away, but now I am like, I have all these memories because I was a freshman in college in the fall of 1991. And that was the Braves worst to first team. And that was the World Series with Jack Morris versus John Smoltz. And I, 
I went out of my way to try to watch it. We didn't have cable in our dorms, but like, you know, or whatever we had to like, I had to have rabbit ears. And then I had to listen to game seven on the radio in like a college shuttle kind of <laughs> thing. And then go back and see someone who recorded it on their v- VCR. Um, I went out of my way for that. And then in 95, of course I was watching the Braves. So I was following that all, but I was way more of just like an average guy who would like pick up the newspaper. Oh, that's how they did today. I wasn't like right. being freaked, you know, freak about it. The internet and sort of the rise of, late 90s you know rec baseball or whatever and and online baseball and analysis really sucked me back in in a major major way yeah no for me it was the it was actually the mcguire sosa home run chase that's that's what brought me back which you know it's 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 like yeah they were roided up or whatever but that was fun as hell so yeah (laughs) right that's that's why i can't i can't get it it's like did you have fun of course you did i I don't care (laughs) well was i picking up the paper every day to see what happened yes i was you know it's it it was it sucked it I mean, I guess intellectually speaking, it sucked there on steroids. And, you know, as I argue in the book, if that bothers you, if you have such a strong ethical line about that, that is a completely legitimate reason. Uh, but it shouldn't bother you if you're otherwise just having the time of your life. Come on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, so speaking of the Braves, one, one of my favorite parts of the book is you talk about uh, Greg Maddox and ah. how uh, a late career start by Maddox kind of gave you a new perspective on your own life. And and I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. So it, I was a lawyer from, I graduated law school in 1998 and I practiced law through 2009. And uh, it sucks for all kinds of reasons. It I, you know, I did okay with it, but I was not well suited to the sort of law I was practicing for most of that time. I was working at a big law firm. I was working way too many hours. I was getting burnout. I was doing bad things for bad people, and I didn't like it. Uh, so by 2006, I was about as burnout as I possibly could have been. I also had two small children at home, so all of the ethical problems were there, and all the I'm not home problems were there. And I was in charge of taking our summer law clerks, which are law students who come and sort of intern for the summer at a law firm, I was in charge of entertainment that summer for them. I took them down to a Cincinnati Reds game. And uh, it was a couple of days after the Cubs, where Maddox was his second time around, uh, traded to the Dodgers at the trade deadline. He was the Dodgers' big uh, playoff push acquisition in 2006. Having been a Braves fan in the in the 90s, of course, Greg Maddox had developed into my favorite player. It was by pure happenstance that Greg Maddox was getting his first start as a Dodger in Great American Ballpark against the Reds on that day in 2006. And I went down and he was kind of toast. You know, he, he still had a little bit left in the tank, but he was not Greg Maddox anymore. He was a mid-rotation starter who might catch lightning in a bottle for a contender. That was the idea. He goes down against the Reds on a hot, steamy, humid night. And he basically is throwing a no hitter through five innings. Greg Maddox never threw a no hitter. He was right. too close to the strike zone. That was just not what he did. He that would rather give game, up a yeah. hit. Yeah, he would rather give up a hit than, you know, have someone do something with a pitch he didn't want him to do or whatever. He'll give up a hit so he can set the guy up for the next time in a more critical <laughs> thing. We've always heard that story. I don't know if that's true or not, but I like that story. So I hope yeah. that's true. Anyway, he has a no hitter going through five and into the sixth inning. And he gets one out, two outs, three outs. And as soon as he gets the third out in the sixth inning, lightning crashes, uh, rain comes down, the tarp comes out. It is the worst summer humid night storm you've ever seen in your life. And it's like a 47 minute rain delay. It was just too long to keep an old Greg Maddox uh, in the game. He knew he wasn't coming back out. He wasn't coming back, but I was so excited as a baseball fan that night. That was probably, you know, I say that I came back to the game in the late 90s and the 2000s because of sabermetrics and everything, but I wasn't back in in, a, in that way. I was in an intellectual way, the way people are into baseball, you know, fantasy, like we talked about and other things. I liked it. I watched it, but I didn't feel it. And that night I absolutely felt it. I was wired hundred miles back to Columbus where I live. I was, I had this Palm Trio phone, which is like this proto Blackberry that people had. And I was like trying to email friends about what I just saw. It took the entire trip just to get like two emails out. Um, but I, I, I took it as look, I'm, I was only what, 30, three then but i felt like i was 47 um 33 in a law firm when you got two little kids is an old 33 um but i felt like i was toast i felt like i was burnt uh greg maddox showed me that even if you are toast and burnt you can have moments you you can you can shine through you can be the best you can be at any given point and i still think about that start all the time in my life and it took me a couple of years after that to figure out what i wanted to do with my life and get myself out of the rut i was in but i got out of that and i 
in some weird ways credit that start uh by Atlanta by uh Greg Maddox for the Dodgers against the the Reds is, is starting that process that's beautiful yeah no well so I mean along those lines like like I know you know your you know how you write about baseball you're you know you're not coming in contact with players a lot you're not sitting down for but if you could pick one player from your entire span of fandom that you could sit down have dinner and a few drinks with who would that be and why oh gosh i mean it probably would be maddox and and the thing is i i know enough about greg maddox to where we probably wouldn't be the best of friends <laughs> i mean <laughs> i i think greg maddox uh if someone told me he was a trumper it would not shock me at all might be um and, and there was yeah. yeah i mean i don't want to think about it too much but yeah whatever <laughs> and then i you know there were stories from like towards the end of his career when he played for san diego you know the way he would like sort of haze rookies in like the most immature and infantile not mean ways but just like come on greg you're like 40 years old stop doing that <laughs> um so i'm not saying we would be buddies and it wouldn't be like the chris farley interviewing uh paul mccartney situation right but i really would like to hear you know him talk about pitching i know there are a bunch of places i can find that and everything but i have dumb questions that come from a far less educated viewpoint than people who interview Greg Maddox tend to have <laughs> um, that I, he thinks differently enough about, or at least he did back when he used to give a lot of interviews, he thinks differently enough about how pitching works and how about baseball works, where I would like to, to talk to him about that for a while. I think. have a chance to pick that brain for a bit. I mean, I would feel so stupid at the end of that conversation because <laughs> I would say something like, so you did this and then you do that. And he's like, what are you talking about? No, it'd be like that. But I don't care. I, if if you're going to be humbled, be humbled by your hero. Right, right. That's a, that's a good point. As long as he's not uh, not nasty to you. or uh... no, He's got enough goodwill in the bank where, I mean, he could basically come out as a, you know, I don't know, Russian general in the Ukrainian war right now. And I'd be like, okay, <laughs> you know, he's got his viewpoint. It's okay. <laughs> He was such a great pitcher. I know. Did, did you not see that game in 1994? <laughs> you, did you not see that? <laughs> so uh, switching gears, um, you know, we've talked about, you know, kind of uh, moving away from baseball and towards music. Um, as a writer who loves music, I am constantly frustrated by the fact that I cannot write and listen to music at the same time. <sighs> Where are you with that? It's horrible. I can't. I can't. I try, but I can't. Everybody I know, like, oh, it's it's well now. When do new albums come out? Now Friday? Now? No, they they used to come out Tuesdays or something. Now they come right. out Friday. Yeah, it's a Friday, and uh, you know there are like eight new albums, and I just listened to this seven times, and then I listened to this new thing. And have you heard this? And I'm like, where do you find time for that? I can't do it because I will try to play them, and if it has lyrics, I can't write. And I think it's just because the way I, there are two different kinds of writers. I think Vonnegut or somebody came up with this. They're like, you know, bashers and dancers or something. I can't remember what the term was. And I'm a basher. I'm somebody who the steam is coming out of my head as I'm writing. Every word is like printed in my mind. And uh, as you, if you're hearing somebody else talk or if you're hearing singing, I can't do it. So to the extent I listen to music, I'll just like listen to, you know, cocktail party jazz or whatever. But for the most part, I just can't. And it pisses me off because there would be so many albums I would listen to and absorb. Because for me, it takes four or five listens to an album I care about anyway, to to really get all the, the nuances of it. And I just have to dedicate the time to do it. I can't really. Yeah, no, same here. Actually, like a lot of times, even even the instrumental stuff is lost on me because I get so absorbed in you know what i'm doing that like you know all of a sudden the side is done and, and i don't remember one it. thing i did find a, i did find kind of an exception but it's not it's so i'm not historically into edm really um electronic and stuff but my wife is super into edm she really loves the stuff and i have gotten an appreciation for it i don't think i'll ever be a fan i'm never gonna be super knowledgeable about it but i generally know like whoever like the top five edm stars are at any given time and I, i'll go to shows with her and things like that um edm is something that you could just or house you know but right. the lower speed stuff if it's melting your face i don't yeah. want to hear it but if it's like you know deep house low tempo um i could listen to that and i could work along with that but you know there's a fine line between listening to music because you love music and listening to ambient music yeah. and uh it kind of leans towards the latter for me, but I could do that at least. I could listen to, you know, a linium or, or, uh, you know, old, if you want to go old massive attack or something mm -hmm. like that, I could, I could do that and work. You can, can go trip hop if, uh, if need be. Bit. As long as it's 
slower. If the, if the drop is going to completely, you know, melt your face off, there's no way right. I can do that. <laughs> That's way too distracting. Well, were, <laughs> were there any any records, any any artists during the course of writing this book that that you know you found particularly inspiring, or just like that, like you went to to kind of uh, you know uh, ch uh, uh, chill out? Maybe the wrong word, but just to like you know when you needed a break, uh, that this music would revive you. Um. It, this is not necessarily just for the book. It was, it's kind of been over a couple of years. Um, they became my favorite band later. Um, and I'm not saying they're the best band I listen to because, you know, they're not the Rolling Stones. Um, they're not even Depeche Mode or anything. I mean, but there's the English band James. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody in America knows them from that song Laid right. uh, that came out in the early 90s. But they, I'm going to, you know, adjust my tie and my hat and my glasses now and say they're much <laughs> but, bigger in England. But actually, actually, that's not even their, but, you know, they, they have a very long history. Uh, they are still a working band. Uh, and a few years, Allison loves them. My wife loves them. Got me into them in a major way beyond just the few singles that I had known. And uh, we saw, we went to England and followed them around on a small club tour and the whole thing. So I really got into them. Um, and the one thing about James that I love, I'm not going to try to be an evangelist for them because a lot of people, that's just not their taste. But one thing I really like about the band, the band is positive. Um, and I don't mean positive in a false sunny way. They have a lot of gloomy songs, but they come from a place where they never fit into a genre, even though they were contemporaries of uh, the Smiths and they opened for the Smiths in the early days, they really weren't a Smiths band. And then they were contemporaries of, of Happy Mondays and, and Manchester and all that. They're from Manchester, but they really weren't that. And then they had their biggest success probably during the Britpop days, but they are not a Britpop band. They never really fit. And so there's this idea that fits with my fandom with them in that I like it because I like it. Right. Um, I, I don't like it because I feel obligated to like it. I don't like it because it's important for me to like it. Um, and it's possible for me to reject strictures and reject orthodoxies and like this band. It doesn't make you transgressive. They're kind of a nerdy band in a lot of ways, but damn it, it's genuine. For as hokey as that can be, genuine is where I kept thinking about in this book. And if I was ever flagging, I have this mix of James songs that I would put on. And it's like, if I was listening to this song in 1997, I would be so completely out of step with everybody else, but I wouldn't care because it bops. Right. And so that's kind of the ethos I was going for with this book. It's, it's, it's funny. I laughed when you said Smiths because my, I, I'm not a huge James fan. I, I mm -hmm. couldn't pick other than Wade, I couldn't pick one of their songs out of a lineup. Um, but my, my most vivid memory related to them was I was in a band that was opening for an English band called the hypnotics. Oh. Um, they were kind of like a heavy stooges MC five sort of influence in you know, early nineties type of thing. And, uh, they were playing in Chicago. It was like a Wednesday night, like a really undersold show. And we were the openers. And I remember that there was a big James poster on the wall of the dressing room for an upcoming, I think like this was like a Tuesday or Wednesday night show. James were like headlining on a Friday or a Saturday oh, or something God. like that. And so the, and I just remember like walking by the hypnotics in, in, you know, in this sort of common area and they're all just sitting there and they're all like in a terrible mood. And, uh, and one of them looks up and sees the James uh, poster. He's like, James, they started out as a bleeding Smiths cover band. <laughs> and so it's so that true. has stayed with me forever. <laughs> oh, it's it's absolutely true, man. If you listen to their discography, like their first, they had like an EP and a few singles and stuff, and they were very clearly trying to be the Smiths. And of course, since you're Morrissey and you're a complete narcissist, you hear this and you're like, oh, they're going to open for us. And right. that's you know how they got to be <laughs> seen like at first. But they weren't like that at all. And then they 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 so totally adopted so many things that happened to be popular at a given time. It didn't really hit the music so much, but their fashion sense and their sensibility and their biggest tour in America until relatively recently, Neil Young, for whatever reason, this was like the worst <laughs> matchup you've ever seen in your life. Neil Young said, you guys are going to open for me. And he, they opened and, and Neil Young told them it's got to be an acoustic show, <laughs> which James is, they got keyboards. It's, they're, they're not that kind of band. But damn it, they did it because, you know, right. we're going to tour with, with Neil yeah. Young and they did like a whole acoustic tour playing Red Rocks, you know, before he does, you know, Harvest Moon or something. I'm like, this is not a band that anyone should ever be into. But for whatever reason, I am. Right. So, so probably no one went out and bought James Records specifically oh. because of that tour. No, no. Every they, to the extent any Americans ever bought James records is because they went and watched the American Pie movies and they put late in it about five, six years after that song came out and that album came out right before the band broke up. <laughs> hey, that song's great. What was that? 
Awesome. Well, Craig, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, thank you for joining us on the Pandemic Baseball Book Club to uh, talk once again, Rethinking Fandom, How to Beat the Sports Industrial Complex at Its Own Game, Craig Calcaterra. Uh, out uh, allegedly April 5th, although it may, copies may be swimming upstream to your uh, local bookseller as we speak. It's like a Spinal Tap record release. It's it's probably out there. I don't know. <laughs> it's barely released. <laughs> Kick my ass for a man. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, thank you all for all of you who are tuning in. Thank you for, for joining us. Go out and buy Craig's book. Go out and buy my book. Go out and buy books. It's, it's, it's an awesome thing to do. We all got to eat, man. Yeah, it, absolutely.